Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. John Ebert. And I'm Tracy McRae. Epilepsy is one of the most common neurologic conditions affecting about 3 million Americans. Two-thirds of epilepsy patients get some relief from medications, but that leaves a million people who continue to suffer from seizures. At Mayo Clinic, a new approach is being tried for those patients, high-tech brain stimulation that was developed and approved for treating congestion for treating conditions such as chronic pain and Parkinson's disease is showing promise for epilepsy patients too. And here to explain is Mayo Clinic neurosurgeon, Dr. Jamie Van Gompel. Welcome to the program, Dr. Van Gompel. It's nice to see you. Thanks for having me, guys. What causes epileptic seizures? There's an awful lot of different causes. Sometimes they're genetic causes. Um, Most of the common causes that make it to a neurosurgeon, though, are causes that have a spot in the brain that's just acting erratically. And um, and in a lot of patients, we can actually treat that spot. But we're here today to talk about as patients that we're not very good at finding that spot. So I once heard epilepsy described as like a thunderstorm, a lightning storm in the brain. Is that still an accurate way to describe it? Yeah, I, I think that's true. I mean, sometimes the um, uh, sometimes those those lightning storms are very localized, but the, obviously the most feared ones are the ones where the lightning storms is the whole brain. Um, and uh, that that quote is directly from a patient. I do I do like that quote quite a bit. Yeah. So um, medication has previously been basically the only thing that, that would work. Is that right? Um, I mean, as I said, there's there's one there's there's particular types of epilepsies that, that can be um, removed. The disease brain can be removed and treated very well. But almost everybody starts with a medication because nobody wants a part of their brain removed, right? Um, and, uh, th- and again, the therapy we're here to talk about today is, is, is those other couple of people that, uh, that fall in between the cracks. Are there always non-medical solutions for, for, for epilepsy? So, so years ago, we would have said no. Okay. Um, and uh, there were some palliative options, but this, this particular therapy, uh, this deep brain stimulation for epilepsy, kind of starts to fill in the cracks uh, of that. Um, kind of as a parlay with the medication talk, uh, the way medications work to, cr- to kind of control seizures or call the seizures is that they just change whether the, how the electrical storm happens in the brain, right? Does it happen if we slow how the electricity goes around or if we make it go faster, that changes whether or not the likelihood of a seizure occurring, right? This particular therapy brings electricity to the brain in the same way as medications do to try to either slow or quicken the, the way the circuits work in an attempt to try to reduce the number of seizures and hopefully with the reduction in seizures, uh, reduce the chance that one could die from a seizure, which is called SUDEP. How do you identify which part of the brain needs the deep brain stimulation? So there's a standard area that we treat. It's in the thalamus for this. And um, we've been doing this for a very, very long time here at the Mayo Clinic. We've been treating one part of the thalamus for patients that have generalized onset seizures, which uh, some of us believe actually come from the thalamus itself. Um, this particular therapy is for patients that have a spot in the brain that's causing the seizures or multiple spots that we're just not good enough to find at this point in time or if they've underwent multiple therapies. And I always say, you know, is, is the juice worth the squeeze on these patients where you, you know, they went through so much to try to find the spot and we don't know. Well, fortunately, this type of therapy actually fills a role for those patients to, to have some success and, and potential for seizure freedom. How is this similar to um, using deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease? It's exactly the same. The, the uh, electrodes, everything has been going into people for, for over two decades. Uh, so there is no safety. It, in terms of difference in safety, there's no different devices that have been going in for that, for dystonia or, or tremor. What's dystonia? Dystonia is a, a part of the body that's acting badly, so it's constantly either um, either contorted or, or, or uh, and sometimes painful, uh, but it's a really uncommon reason to use it for, we, we, I treat a lot of patients with epilepsy in my practice, and, you know, one of the things they struggle with is what should really be the goal um, when we think about deep brain stimulation and these some more advanced interventions. Are they looking for no seizures, or what are reasonable goals to, for patients to expect in terms of outcomes from any kind of therapy we provide? Yeah, and, and that's a really important to uh, understand the expectation of the procedure up front. Uh, um, for this particular procedure, the, a large randomized control trial was performed for it. 
that showed that in patients that underwent this therapy that were resistant to multiple other therapies, between 5 and 10% became seizure-free for periods of over six months, which uh, doesn't sound like a lot, but for that 5 to 10% of patients, that's quite a, uh, um, a big deal. However, we think of this more of as a palliative therapy in terms of patients that we don't think realistically we can get to be to seizure freedom, we think we can reduce seizures over time. So 50% or more, it looks like between 50 and 60% of patients will respond to this therapy. And of those that respond to it, the interesting thing is if we follow them over time, they continually get better by having less seizures. And that's something that we're just starting to understand with these neural stimulation therapies is that they may be neural restorative and that over time, if we can just stop some of the seizures, we may be able to get better and better seizure control with medications. Is it true that when we look at kids who, children, for example, who have seizures long term, that it's more damaging for the brain? You talk about this sort of neuroregenerative thing. We, mm -hmm. always, we always think about the reason why you don't ha want to have seizures all the time is because it can actually cause some level of damage. Is that true for kids and adults? Or I, I think that's, uh, that's the prevailing theories right okay. now, yeah. is, that, uh, is that one seizure may beget another. And it's probably true that, that this isn't really a static state. It's more of a dynamic state, meaning that as you have more seizures, maybe the seizure onset area grows over time because of that damage that's created by either local lack of oxygen to the brain or just too much electrical activity. There's a couple of theories around that, but I think it's true that there's damage that each seizure incurs. What are risks for epileptic patients using deep brain stimulation? So the risks uh, compared to some of the traditional uh, therapies, I think, are less. Um, there's a 5% total chance of having a problem with the procedure. The most common problem is, you know, it's not normal to have something external put into your, into your body. Now, it's becoming very normal because people, you see people walking around with pacemakers sure. or, or these things. So, uh, you know, we always talk about, you know, in the future, are people going to have five batteries across their chest? But it's, it's the fact that we're putting an external device in, so the chance of an infection exists, and it really is relative to what your pre-op or um, other problems are, like do you have diabetes or something like that. Um, but the risk of having a major problem from the procedure is very, very low. It's less than 1%, the chance of having a bleed or something like that. And the good news is, is that if it doesn't work, it's actually a reversible procedure. It's removable, um, uh, and the intention is not to hurt something with it. And now if patients wind up for these, you know, you know, for appropriate uh, selection criteria sort of exercise and the patients are provided this device, do they have to worry about things like travel and metal detectors and CT scans and MRIs? All those things are the things that my patients always say, well, what's going to happen once I get this and how much is it going to change my life? It may improve seizures, but what are the other things I have to change? Yeah, you could still go through the, the, <laughs> the metal detectors at the airport. Now you do have to carry a card like you do with some of the pacemakers. Um, but I, I think, you know, for some patients, it depends on their, their lifestyle. So a lot of patients choose a battery that's not rechargeable because they don't want to think about having to, you know, get to that energy source once a week and, and doing it. it. And they actually feel as though recharging the battery, which is an option with some of these, reminds them of their problem. Mm -hmm. So, but in some patients, they, they go for the rechargeable options with the understanding that nothing's in there forever, like your iPhone, right? So, you know, after two years, it's going to run its life. The rechargeable batteries just offer a longer period in time in which we have to still replace the, the, the battery. The batteries typically are replaced around five to seven years for this particular problem, um, and the rechargeable batteries we don't know. The, the really interesting thing about it is that the frequencies we use are much, much less than the common therapies used right now for movement disorders, which they stimulate about 210, sometimes 180 times a second. For this, we're between 5 and 40. So you can see the battery life we expect to be probably two or three times as it, long. And you set that, right? You'll have a patient come in and we'll say we've got a 50% reduction in your seizures. Let's change the frequency or we've got only 20% reduction. Then your team kind of changes the settings on that. Is so I, I personally don't know oh, yeah, I was smart okay. enough to do so, but, <laughs> right. uh, you know, like all things at Mayo, it's a very collaborative practice. Sure. And we have excellent uh, um, doctors that are responsible for programming those devices. And it's true that sometimes those programs can make seizures worse mm -hmm. and some do better. And it's, it's really an, a collaborative experience with the patient and that doctor trying to improve things. And it's a lot like medications. I know a lot of the epilepsy patients that are probably listening out there, they've, they've had probably the experience of taking a medication as well that's worsened their seizures, 
and it's it's uh, following that seizure diary and, and, and those types of interactions with the physician here. The nice part is that the, the stimulation itself doesn't have effects over the rest of the body. I tell the patients that the mm-hmm. stimulation is trying to do the same thing medications are doing, but you're not getting that tremor or those other mm-hmm. problems that you have because it's it's directed at one particular spot. Sure. And, uh, you know, with the medications, you can give as much medication, uh, if you could give as much medication uh, to control the seizures, unfortunately, they would have substantial side effects from some of those things because all the, all the seizure medications probably work with time. So. Sure. Where is the research going using deep brain stimulation? Well, uh, we have a couple of research studies open here right now. You know, we're trying to also record for the patients so they don't have to go right down. So that's a big important one right now is that, you know, we want to really have um, valid objective data. So when we put this in, if we know we're having 10 seizures a month and if we make a change and we have five next month and we can see that change rather than requiring them to record their seizures because mm-hmm. sometimes they have seizures at nighttime and they don't even know when they've had seizures. Right. And those can be equally damaging. Mm-hmm. We've been talking about deep brain stimulation being used to treat epilepsy with Mayo Clinic neurosurgeon Dr. Jamie Van Gompel. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.